it's great because it's a nice, small, intimate group. So we'll be able to ask a lot of questions, um, get into some good discussion. And I'm going to introduce Tim. And Bob, well, do you want me to introduce you first? Yeah. I want to introduce Tim Hayes. He's a very dear friend of mine. And good morning. he's an expert in public relations, copywriting. He has built a very, very successful business. Um, and I've had the pleasure of knowing him for many years and work with him. So he's really someone that you can tap into his expertise. And it's, I'm very grateful. Sure. That James Thank is you. grateful that he's willing to share it with all of us for free. And because it's a, a small group, we thought that we'd go around the room, introduce ourselves in our business, and what you hope to get out of today. Just give me a feel of who you are and right. what, what you do. <laughs> yep. And I should say, I'm Karen Bergeron, and I'm Vice President of the Great Little Chamber of Commerce. So do you want to start, Nancy? Yeah, start. I'm Nancy Page, uh, I'm in the School of Chamber of Massachusetts, Page School of Electrical Technology. Cool. And Excellent. So nice. My goal is to try to figure out how to target that, you know, the, the, the 20 to 30 age range because they're very, the thought process is very different. It's, it certainly is, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, social media is kind of a godsend for, for a business like yours for that age group. So yeah, uh, excellent. And you are? Hi, I'm Taylor. I am Brown Utah, or United Team College Spectator, and all. Okay. Excellent. Well, you'll find out how valuable that is to you during our presentation today, actually. And you, Armia? Hi, I'm Victoria McCann. Um, I'm a psychologist with practicing. Oh, excellent. So, um, I'll be looking for the questions. You know, when I was in the Army, I was shaving every day and was wrecking my eye. I always considered it like trial. I just never took the step. <laughs> yeah, okay. Did you? Nice. And actually, last month I became my full time job. Excellent. So, just looking to grow my ability to take to the next level right now because I was let go from a non profit job. So, okay. to make that my main job, my main career path right now. Nice. Do you want to come in? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jenny Lee. I'm the Director of Public Relations and Marketing at the University. And I need ah. some uh, new ways to uh, market the school. Okay. And um, I'm not really sure which way that would be. So. Sure. Just so I can win those two, I'm going to learn. This is how me is wonderful. Wow. Oh, there you go. That's a whole daycare nursery. It's amazing. Excellent. Thank you so yeah. much. And Joanne has won a big one award. National Director of the Year. Excellent. Director. Nice. Yeah, so we're very, very, very proud of Joanne. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Debbie Swanson. Cool. We're in the same. I start. You know, it's funny. I started as a copy, a freelance copywriter, and because people needed help with what they paid me to give them, I ended up moving more and more into marketing consulting. Yeah, so. Uh, social media grows. People just want to get out there, but not Excellent. Well, we'll we'll actually have some good stuff for you here today. Now I've met you before, but I can't remember your name. The I'm the director of development for the Northeastern Independent Living Program in oh. Lawrence, Mass. Okay. And, uh, always looking for ways to market and do outreach. It's probably one of the things that nonprofits don't do a good job at. It's so focused on the mission. Yes. So often that piece is not done as perhaps as well as it should be. So good. I'm to Hopefully, I can give you some good tips here today. Yeah. Like yep. And because uh, I, I met you at the Mega Mixer out there at the Country Club in, in Methuen. Yeah. That's where we met the first right time. Yep, right. okay, cool. I can't remember his name, but I do remember his face. <laughs> so, as much as possible, I tried to theme today's 
tried to theme today's little gathering as fall into business for 2015. So hopefully what I hope to give you today is some tips, some tactics, some strategies, something that one, if it's just one little idea that you can grab on, that'd be great. So something that, that what you did today actually made you some money. Here there be dragons. That's, a, that's actually a quote from ancient mariners. When map makers found uh, uncharted areas, seamen thought there were sea monsters and mermaids and everything. So what they would do in order to disguise the fact that they didn't know what was there, they would write this symbol, here there be dragons. Hope, so they would hope the less intrepid captains wouldn't go out into the ocean, get lost, and blame them because he <laughs> uses their charts. But, uh, the thing is, is this, of course, is a free presentation, and there's always the cynical thing that you get what you pay for, okay? Yeah, you didn't pay anything for this, and of course, but they also say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Everything, one way or another, has a cost, and that's Tinsafal, uh, and that's the name of my company, Tinsafal Enterprises. It is that there's no such thing as a free lunch. You have to put the work in to get the work back. Uh, or you have to make the investment to get the money back. You have to read the books and go to the programs and take what you learn to get back. Uh, now, there are two ways to look at today's presentation. We could parse it very legally and say, hey, the cost of this was already built into my chamber membership, which is absolutely true. The other way to look at it is, is a little more costly, is what you have done today is you have invested with me the most precious of non-renewable resources, which is your time. Now, as business owners and, and executives in your companies, uh, hopefully you know exactly what the cost of an hour of your time is worth, okay? So what you've done is you've invested what you're worth for the time that we're spending here this morning. So one, I'm humbled that you would do that, and I thank you very much. Two, it makes it pretty responsible on my part that I give you something that you can leave with when you, when you walk out of here today that'll help your business's uh, growth in 2015. Now, judging by the introductions that we had here this morning, it seems like everybody's coming here looking for something, and I hope you are. What I plan to do is give you some tips, strategies, strategies, tactics, new ways of maybe looking at things or maybe old ways of looking at things that you hadn't considered in a while. So what uh, the idea is, is that you can leave here today with a seed. Because a seed is a very, very powerful analogy. If you stop and think, if you ask yourself, how many seeds are in an apple, you've asked a very limiting question. If you ask yourself, how many apples are in an apple seed, well, and then you've expanded your universe and opened up your mind to hopefully new and better things. So today I want to give you that seed. It's up to you, of course, to water it with your imaginations and your ability to adapt it, feed it, and nurture it with your hard work and your persistence. And in the end of 2015, when you look at the end of the year, there's a bigger bottom line than there was the year before. Just on as much as one little idea. The other thing is, if you came here looking for today, um, you, you, you already know the secret about finding things is only reserved for the seekers. Nothing ever comes up to find you. You have to go and look for it. The late Jim Rome uh, used this in a lot of his presentations. Uh, so if you're looking, you have, if you, if you look, you find. Biblically, it says, if you seek, you shall find. So thank you for being seekers here this morning. What we'll be discussing today is basically five W's. Who do you market to and sell to? What means do you use to get them to become clients? When you should advertise, where you should advertise, and, and most importantly, why people buy so that you know you can actually tap into uh, a better way of selling uh, instead of beating them to death, actually talking to them on the same wavelength, addressing their reasons of why they should buy. Okay, so let's get started with the who. We're gonna focus on a couple of things this morning. First of all, who is your best client? If you stop, I'm not going to, now, the other thing is, I'm not putting anybody on the spot. I'm not asking anybody to raise hands. You don't have to give any examples or whatever. 
just let me do the teaching and you do the learning, and that way um, you can have a little better time and have, we'll take the tension right out of the room right off of the bat, okay? But you have a best client. You have that one client that you know at the end of the day is your most reliable client. It's the person who has given you the most referrals. It's the person that keeps buying. When you test out new maybe products or offerings to serve, they're one of the first ones in line to buy from you. The other group that you have is the top 10% of your clients. Uh, these are the people who are, who are loyal, uh, who, who buy a lot from you. Uh, and then, of course, there's what are called the Pareto clients, or the top 20% of your clients that more, more normally than not, when I look at a business's books and its client list, 80% of their profits come from really the top 20% of their clients. So the first thing I ask a business owner when I'm sitting with them in a one-on-one -on -one conversation is, do you target your best client? Have you figured out who they are? Or are you target your top 20% clients? And have you ever thought about maybe having this? 100% of your client list made up of the same type of people who make up your top one, top 10, or 20%. And when I do work with these folks, I usually find out four reasons why they've got a client list that goes from the top 1% to the top, to the bottom 10%. And these are the clients that complain the most. They, they try and nail you on price. They, they, they give you more of a heart. You've got to resell them every single time you do any kind of transaction with them. And uh, you kind of wish that, <laughs> that your competitors would pick them off, but they never seem to go anywhere. But there's four reasons why a lot of, that I've discovered that businesses don't, don't get them. First of all, they never know where they really came from in the first part. You know, when they came and opened the business, uh, they might have had a relationship with a client from another company, or it might be a family member or, or a close friend who says, oh, what you're doing, I need, and, and that becomes their client. Um, Next thing is there's no deliberate targeting of your best clients. When you look at your best clients, and we're gonna go into how you go looking for them here in a moment, but you, you don't know who they are. You know, what kind of neighborhoods do they live in? What kind, if you're a business to business, what kind of business do they own? Um, in, in the case of the childcare, how many children do they have uh, that, are, that are preschool age? You know, they never stopped and looked at this is, these are my best clients, this is what I should know about them. And they've never done that. Next is, if they've taken the step of knowing who their, kind of their best clients was, they, they're, they're befuddled, well, where do I find these people? Oh, good heavens, how do I find them? Okay, um, they're out there. They, you wouldn't have any in the first place if they weren't out there. Okay, so that's where they, so you know where to get them. And next, you have to get, you have to attract them the right way. Um, they, they just don't, they just don't, uh, they're not open to every offer. Face it, you're bombarded with, on average, between 4,000 and 5,000 ads or marketing message in the course of a day, okay? We tune all of that out. We couldn't get through a day if we tune all that out. Me, I'm a little different. I probably tune in a little more because I'm always searching for ideas that I can take and apply and send to my clients. But the thing is, is you gotta know the right keys for attracting. There are two components when you're looking for these people that make up how you make up your avatar or your, your picture in your mind of an ideal client. Uh, and the two types of uh, information are demographic information, and more and more, people are really expanding into this area, into psychographic information. This is, this is the, uh, the attitudes and the mindset of your client, not necessarily uh, their basics. Now, the demographics or the basics. I am amazed when I talk with people how few business owners, uh, especially even established business owners, but business people who are starting a business and, and really starting to fledgingly looking for that for those clients, uh, don't even consider the demographic information. And this is basic information, of course, age, gender, income, family type and size. There you go for the for the daycare. Uh, let me get those good Catholics. They got six kids. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, where they live, 
town, neighborhood, uh, one of the things that you should know if, if you do business to consumers, okay, the Postal Service has an excellent, excellent marketing program called Every, the Every Address Program, and they allow you to get their list, use their list, and it's a free service, by the way, uh, and you can break it down, you, you know, you're getting your clients from Lowell, but you want affluent clients, they can break it down by postal and carrier route, so you're getting the right, so you can take the demographic information of a town and you can parse it down, right down to a postal carrier route, so that way, you save money because you, now you're going after the people that you're looking for. You're not blanketing the area. So it uh, works things. Of course, things like ethnicity are still important. I mean, where I grew up, uh, we were the Irish parish. So I'm Irish. I mean, I know I'm American, but everybody else, the Hayes, the Donnellys, the O'Connells, we're all Irish. And we're, that's where we all went to church. Uh, what's their education level that you're looking for? Um, Everybody knows Cy Sims. I don't know if you remember his ads, but he said, an educated client is his best client, <laughs> okay? And of course, one, do they have a job? <laughs> People that you're looking at, they have a job. Do they have money to spend? And what kind of work are they in? And what you want to do is, what we look for is commonalities in all of these demog demographic information. Uh, to start building your customer list. Next, more involved, a uh, little more, and of course, it's, it's more work. Uh, the psychographic information. This is getting into the mind of the people that you do business with. Uh, back at the turn of the century in the 1919s and the 1920s, Robert Collier, who was a famous ad executive and copywriter at the time, said the key to selling was to get into the conversation going on in his client's head. So just to step right in and develop that instant rapport and relationship. And that's the psychographic information. And, and taking that, you need to know their values, um, family values, religious values, uh, moral values, business values. Um, those are things that are important. What are their interests and hobbies? Because you know something, when you want to strike up a conversation, you want a commonality, um, you'd be surprised when you analyze your customer list how much a lot of your best com customers have in common. Political affiliation, which is quite the topic this morning, no doubt, because uh, we've seen a, a, a shift in, in, in the Senate, uh, a bigger shift in the, in, the, in the Congress, and of course we may still yet to be determined a shift in, in, in the party and governance. Uh, yes? She conceded 15 minutes. Oh, she did, okay. I was setting up, all right, so, and now, uh, but political affiliation. Now how many people who you think are fence sitters are already gone this way or gone that way. So those are things that, you, that are helpful to know. It's also helpful to know that in the course of your marketing that the clients that you want, if you know their values and, and you know their interests, you don't want to slight them either. You want to you either avoid it or, or show that you're on their side. What's their lifestyle? Are they married? Are they single? Do they live together? Is it a blended family? Is it a, a traditional family? Is it, a, is it a now even a more blended, you know, is it now with a new, new family type? With, with, are they, is it a gay marriage? That type of thing. Okay, those are things to know. What their attitude is on life. Are these people optimistic? Are they pe pessimistic? Are they, um, are they hermits or are they social? Um, and of course, their personality. Um, you know, one of the things we'll get into in just a minute is, is how working with a person's personality you could be speaking English, but you could, not be, you could not be connecting with people any further apart as if you were speaking a foreign language. But we'll get into that in just a minute. Psychographic questions. These are, these are the kind of questions you need to ask yourself about your clients um, that, that really puts you on the right track. This kind of makes it a little easier than going down that, that psychographic list. But what keeps them up at night? What's causing them to lose sleep? Every person who has a client <laughs> they've, they've got concerns, they've got issues, they've got problems, and, and they've got things. What is it that you do? Of course, it leads to the next question. What's their single big old problem that you and your business and the services or the products that you provide can solve for them? And finally, and then this goes into really deep into the psychographic questions, what is it that they privately desire that you can, you can help them achieve? And if you can do that, or as the late Zig Ziglar once said, you know, you help anybody get what they want, you'll get everything you want. Profiling, guess what? It's just not for the FBI anymore. Uh, it really is incumbent on you folks as business owners 
to really get to know your best clients. Um, and it's important because, you know, one of the biggest mistakes people make, especially when they got a bigger customer list, they treat each customer exactly the same. Everybody gets the same offer, everybody gets the same product, everybody gets the same access, everybody gets the same, the same phone number to call, uh, which for your best clients, that's kind of a mistake. You want to make sure that your best clients are treated uh, as well as they are. And how do you get to know them? Well, you can use surveys. Um, SurveyMonkey is, a, is, is probably the easiest survey site to use, and it's actually free. Uh, lunch, it's a huge thing. You know what? You take people out, and you break bread with them, and you sit at the table away from your office and away from their office, you can learn a wealth of information. So you, know, you really should be taking, having coffee or having lunch with your best clients on, on a regular basis. Yeah, pick up the tab. <laughs> but you know something, you're, you're really buying information that you can't get anyplace else. Now, there are profiling services. The one thing I will caution you is that they are for larger companies. If you've got like four or 5,000 you know, clients, what they actually do in these uh, Experian, iBehavior, and Axicom, it, it is amazing what they will send you back of a psychographic picture of your, of your client. Uh, you'll find that they, there's a huge percentage of them that, that are, are gardeners. There's a huge percentage of them that own boats. Well, there's a huge percentage of them that are active in their local community, uh, especially with a nonprofit. You want to tap into those centers of influence. Uh, so uh, one of the things I do recommend when I'm working with, with kind of clients that I work with is say I've got a services firm, say I got a law firm, or I got a, an accounting firm, or I got a uh, bookkeeping service, or, or some other type of business service, I'll, and, they, and they actually share the same type of uh, demographic information with their clients, I'll have them pull their lists and go and get that, and they split the cost, uh, but they come back with a wealth of information. So those are services as your business grows that you know that are available out there. You're, you're brand new. Uh, I know what it was like when I was in 2006 when I started copywriting. Uh, I've been doing it for years. Oh, well, when I, when I started, it was like, how do I get a, what did I do? How do I get a customer? For anybody who's here, um, it's very difficult to get a client. And if somebody's already using your product or services, it's even more difficult because they're already in a relationship with another business. So why is it hard to get it? Well, I'm going to give you an example of why. Let me show you something. Now, you see these three chairs? What I would like you to do really quickly, do not think, do not put any thought on it rapidly. What do you see? Give yourself just a minute here. Just what do you see looking at those three chairs? No, no need to tell me. Just, just you come up with your own personal list. And like I said, don't, don't delve deeply into it. Just go. Because right. that's actually your, your basic instinct that takes over when you do it on a rapid basis like that. Okay. Now, I see three chairs, but I see three chairs differently than you would see three chairs. And you see three chairs, and you may see things that are same. You may see things that are different. Hey, there's three places to sit. There are three chairs. They all got backs. Uh, that's what I'm saying. This, but basically, there's basically two. Oh, oh that's should have been there when we were looking at the chairs. <laughs> there are basically two outlooks. Now, this comes from um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the with neuro linguistic programming or NLP. Um, it's it's really a, a, a division of psychology, and uh, the the people who came up with this particular exercise are uh, Marilyn and Wyatt Woodsmall in their book People Pattern Power. Uh, they they point out that there are nine patterns that we all have in one degree or another, so that you know what your way of looking at the world is, but you're also able to determine what way the people you're dealing with look at the world, so you can kind of suspend your way to move their way in order to, to build a better relationship. But basically, there are two outlooks. There's a sameness orientation. When you looked at the three chairs, the first thing you noticed was what was similar, and then you noticed some differences. Then there's also the difference orientation. This is the people who makes distinctions. The first thing that you saw was three different chairs, uh, and you went those, and then 
later you would backfill with what some similarities are. So have you ever wondered why you've never gone to a different pharmacy? Why you go to the same, if you ordered out tonight pizza or, or Chinese food, it's the exact same restaurant you used last week or the week before. Or have you ever wondered why you, know, you, you go to the same restaurant, you order the same thing, or you go to the same restaurant, you order something different. Or if you go to a different restaurant and you order the same thing they ate at the other restaurant. Those, those are, those, that, what that is, is that is the change pattern that, that you have developed that you'll work with. And there's four, basically, four groups. There's the extreme sameness. Um, these are the people that, that, you ever met somebody who does the exact same thing at the same time? Okay, uh, these are the people that say, the heck with being pioneers, they only come back with arrows in their butts. Okay, <laughs> then there's qualified sameness. What that does is when you look at something, you see the similarities first, and then you might notice the nuances after. That's the majority of the group, 55% of us. I know I'm right there in the qualified sameness. Next is the qualified difference. These are the people who look at something, see the differences, and, but also later on can appreciate the sameness. Now, and then of course, there is the extreme difference. Um, this group here, group number one, calls nuts, okay? But these people are, are the people who enjoy variety. They enjoy life. They, uh, they are the early adopters of all new technologies. They, 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 nothing ever stays the same. They want to try and do their, their life's constant experimenters. Uh, if it wasn't for the extreme difference people, I'm sure a lot of our medical and scientific discoveries would, would never have existed. Um, they're, they, they're, they're the group, number four is the one that calls group one the, the anal retentives. Uh, they both think they're nuts. Um, there's, there's more communication to be made between the 55 and the 35 percent. But like I was saying earlier, you should know, you should be aware of what your people pattern is, you know. And then you should also, when you're dealing, especially in a sales situation, kind of figure out by asking a couple of key questions, what their, their pattern is. Because what you want to do is you want to be able to talk to people on their pattern. If you're a, a qualified sameness and you're talking to a qualified uh, you know, a difference person, you kind of have to alter your way of thinking a little bit and alter your questioning so that you prove that your business is different, but, in, but on the backside, it gives them some of the same security, the same the same, uh, the same business that they're looking for uh, and maybe a little better, okay? But you gotta be aware of that. So let's get into what. We're gonna look at this morning what type of marketing you should be using. There's, there's, there's really only two camps that, that fall into it. Uh, there's, there's what's called institutional or brand advertising and of course then there's what's called direct response advertising and then there's a raging debate in the direct response advertising. There's the ones who use direct response advertising, but it's really cleverly disguised institutional advertising. And then there's the group that people disparage, they call the mail order group. Oh, you guys are all that mail order group, that only works, right? mail's dead. Well, guess what, it's not. Um, so we're gonna look uh, at the five, four different types of ads that you can put out to, to market your business. Uh, each one is distinct, each one has its place, uh, each one may be used by you, uh, or shunned by you depending on uh, what you know about your clients with their psychological with the psycho and demographic information. And I'm gonna look, we're gonna go delve just very briefly into this. But what happens when you do put out an ad and you get a response? Uh, there, there's a typical response that a lot of small businesses have. And then of course, then there are the guys who really kind of delve into things a little deeply and actually design a system. So when they put an ad out, it it actually creates a client somewhere down the road, if not immediately, at least somewhere down the road. Direct response marketing um, is what we're gonna look at as the marketing. This is especially important for small businesses. We have limited budgets, we, we have limited time, uh, we really need clients <laughs> and cash flow. Um, so the, the, the system of marketing best able to do that and doing it at the best and in sometimes even the least cost is direct response marketing. Um, in his book, The Demographic Cliff, which uh, talks about the great deflation from uh, 2014 to 2019, Harry Dent 
and when it uh, goes through very specific sections of what's happening in investments, real estate, healthcare, uh, and he actually has a section on business, and it's his conclusion that businesses um, that don't adapt to direct response marketing are, are in a lot of trouble because uh, it's getting harder and harder to get a client. Uh, people are getting more and more cynical, um, and, and people are, have less and less money, in his, in his view, and are being very, very frugal with it. So he found that, in his, at least in his studies, and he's a demog demograph, he does demographics, he doesn't do marketing. He found, his, it was his conclusion that direct response marketing was, was the better way to go. What is direct response marketing? Well, very simple. It's a system of marketing that holds your advertising across all media. That means the type of Democrat direct response works in every media, okay? Uh, to a standard of accountability no different than you would hold your sales staff or you would hold yourself. Now, a lot of us are in solo practices, so we're also our chief salesman. So we need, you know, if we want to keep the lights on and we want to keep the bills paid and we want to not because we know that now that we've become self-employed, we are unemployable <laughs> to, a, to a large degree. Uh, how to keep moving forward. Now, direct response marketing, um, anything has a pattern, okay? There, there's a system to direct response marketing, and these, these are its main tenets, okay? Uh, first thing is, is that your message goes to the right people using the right media, or what's called the message to market the media match. The other thing is, is when you present yourself to a new client or a new prospect, or in, even through your advertising uh, and through your various marketing, you get favorable attention. You're, not, you're just not one of those 5,000 messages that are going straight up here. We want it to come in right in here and say, hey, I, I think I might want to find out a little more. It provides social proof. The one thing that's important is that the people you do business with are your best salespeople, so that you have proof, uh, whether it's industry studies, marketing studies, your own clients' testimonials, that you have proof, okay? Uh, and one of the keys to direct response marketing is in everything you do, you make an offer, okay? It's important that if you've gotten their attention and you've kept them their attention for five seconds, Give them something, uh, and give them something that's of a low threshold. Don't, don't make an ad this big to try and make a $5,000 sale. You can't do that. Uh, maybe you can do it with an ad this big or a 16-page sales letter or a 16-page landing page. That might be well, but make sure you give them something that's of a low enough threshold that they raise their hand and say, I have some interest. The important step to that is, and again, we'll get into that in systems in just a minute, is it builds a relationship. You don't necessarily have to sell the person for the first time. All you need to get is their favorable attention, and then what happens is, is they open the door, and they say, okay, now sell me. In a way, you start attracting them to your way of thinking, to your offers, to your marketing messages, instead of chasing them down the street with a club. Yeah, listen to this. And finally, uh, somebody that has now come to you, has built a relationship with you, guess what? The sales process is much easier. You actually engage in what's called low resistance selling, um, which there's a book on that, by the way. I can't, uh, can't remember the name of the guy who wrote it, but if you ever get a chance, it's called Zero Resistance Selling, and it goes into that pretty deeply. What are the advantages of direct marketing? Well, I'll tell you what. For those of us who are in small business, who have to compete against established business people or bigger companies or even if we're retail against big box stores or against big service companies, um, we, it has an advantage to us that, you know what, it's funny, the bigger companies get, the more they forget this. So this is really plays to your advantage. One, it uses the demographic and psychographic information, okay? It's one thing to have the information, it's another thing to have a system that uses it in direct response marketing is the easiest way to do it. It reduces your cost. Um, you can advertise in a big area with lots of people. You know, the, the sales rep will tell you, oh yeah, we got 10,000 people who see this every day. Yeah, but how many of those 10,000 people are interested in what you're in, okay? So the idea is you actually 
can figure out better places to put your ads where you're going to get that favorable attention. And that saves you money because there's, no, there's less waste. There's always waste in advertising, but if you put an ad in that has 50,000 people who see it and you get no response versus an ad that maybe have 5,000 people but, uh, you get a, but you get a bigger percentage response. Um, things like ads in the right place that are, that are really highly specific. Like I said earlier, the, every, the postal services, every address program is, is absolutely one. And using things like Valpac and community values that, because you can target the communities that you want those ads to go to so you're not wasting money uh, on, on marketing that's not gonna produce anything. One of the great things about uh, direct response marketing is you can actually test first. You can, um, you can figure out who you, you can use your demographic information, figure out who you want, figure out a message, but you know what? You send out or test a smaller ad and decide if you get good response, well then guess what? You know that there's less risk when you roll it out to a bigger audience. So that saves you a lot of money up front, okay? Direct response marketing is not limited to any media. There used to be, uh, and, and still is. Oh, it's different if you use Facebook. It's different if you use LinkedIn. If it's different if you use the web. It's not. The, the messages that get people's attention and get clients work equally well across all media. Now, a little trickier with things, newer things like Facebook because there's still a lot of experimentation going on. Um, and you said you use Facebook, right? I'm working on it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually, at the Mixer 2, <laughs> Three weeks ago uh, at the dental center, uh, Gentle Hill Dental Center, uh, I met Priscilla, Des the people from Priscilla Designs, and they're the very first people I've actually met who are actively getting business on, on Facebook. So, uh, you, you are. Sure. Exactly, but, but uh, it's doable. All my advertising is Facebook. It's, you know, it is doable. Okay, so you know, don't, there's, there's people in my ilk who say, oh, social media is a waste of time. No, it's not a waste of time if you learn how to do it right. The only thing, the thing is with social media right now, it's still in such, just such a new phase. We're all doing this to, to try, and, try and get what we can out of it. Um, when you get results using direct response media, guess what? Those results become predictable. If I use this headline and this message, I know if I send out a thousand, a thousand pieces of mail, I'm gonna get this response. Or if I put this particular message on Facebook, I know there's a certain percentage of the people who follow me on Facebook that they'll get that. So it produces predictable results. And you'd be surprised how many people get ads and they're getting response, they got four or five ads and you ask them, well, which one's doing the best? I don't know, they're, I'm just getting, I'm advertising, I'm getting people. So, you, it's, so remember, it is measurable. Um, you should always set up your, your marketing so it's segmented. So you know if you do X and you get X number of phone calls or X number of site visits or X number of likes on your Facebook, uh, you, you can measure it. It's accountable. You know, when you write a check to conduct a marketing program, to do an ad campaign, uh, you know, you want to make sure that if I spend a dollar, I at least want to break even and get a dollar back. Or if I invest a dollar and I get five dollars back, then I know, some, I know I'm doing something right. So it's accountable in that way. Uh, next, a lot of people make the mistake of spending dollars to make dimes. And what that is, is that they will go and put an ad and they'll put an offer in the ad and it's just the one offer. One of the things you should always do, and it's a direct response marketing principle, is that there's generally more than one offer. There's your prime offer, which you want to try and make some money off of, but then there's another offer where they get some free information or they get, uh, they get a, a book from you or they get a brochure or they get a special report or, or they get some access on your website to, to information that only people who applied to get them because what you're doing is now you're, you're increasing your response and you're actually getting people who not ready to buy from you at right that minute, but you know something, now you got people in your pipeline and your sales funnel that you can develop. So those are your advantages of direct response marketing. Now, one of the things I deal a lot with, and I'm sure my copywriter friend here, you probably write ads for your folks as well. Um, they're, and they, Everybody has an idea, you know, everybody's David Ogilvy when they're, they own it, run a business, you know. They don't want what they want, and I know for a fact she's present, brought the ad in 
spent hours working on it, and then the guy goes, nah, that's not what I'm looking for. Okay, that's one of the frustrations of the job. But there are basically four types of ads um, that are available to you and that you should consider. Uh, first and foremost is the product focus ad, or the, this is called the branding ad, or the institutional ad. In this case, um, the, the product, it's all about the product, okay? This is where you can present your USP, your unique sales proposition. You know what makes me different? This is what makes my product different. Uh, generally, there's some promise of a benefit, but generally you'll find out in most ads that you see, they're kind of like an image or a feel good or a product type thing, and uh, it's that. Uh, the typical ad that you see that, that is a product photo, of course, is our automo automobile companies. Uh, it's usually 60% product, 30% price, and 10% of a reason why, why to buy. But if you look at most local ads in the paper, what comes in your mailbox from, from automotive dealers, it's all pr price, 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 or product, product, product. This car, this car, this car. Product, product, product. Um, if you've got a lot of money and you've got a lot, a lot of time, these ads are great. You know, they eventually work. But uh, this is, we leave this for the big dumb companies. <laughs> Next is price ad. It's all about the price. It doesn't matter what your product is. This is what really becomes your unique value proposition. Uh, you, my price is low, lower, lowest. Uh, you know, it reduces sales resistance by reducing the price. Okay, so what you're doing is you're building a value. Of course, one of the keys of if you're going to offer the lowest price is there are people who are cynical. You know, you get what you pay for. Uh, the important thing is, is uh, reversing that risk, you know, offsetting the reduced price with a good guarantee. Uh, typical ads that offer price, of course, are good friends at Walmart. Uh, they're more and more focusing on product, but it's still 80% price and 20% product. Geico Insurance, I'm sure we all know who the, who the gecko is and who Flo is and all of those good folks. 100% uh, price, uh, and it drives our local our local sales, local insurance companies crazy, uh, but you can compete against it. Uh, of course, if you're familiar with morning news or TV, uh, National Floyds Direct, you know, they're the company that will beat any price by 15% or it's free. It's a pure price play. It must work because they're still advertising every 365 days a year for as many years as I can remember right now. Uh, next is the focus on the customer. Uh, this basically identifies a customer. You're kind of like using some psychographic information here. You're calling the customer out. Uh, you're not saying anything, initially, you're not saying anything about your product. Uh, it usually IDs the product by naming a condition or an ailment or uh, some type of uh, situation that they might be in. Typical focus on customer ads is sleep number bed. What's your number? Advil, do you have pain? Do you have back pain? Do you have muscle pain? Do you have headaches? Uh, my favorite new commercial is the, the Galaxy X5 commercial. Have you seen the commercial about the wall huggers? Everybody's got their, their, their smartphone and they're all against the wall, all plugged in in the airport, in the trains, they're everywhere. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a flagging type ad. Now that gets your attention because it actually uses humor, but it actually is attaching humor to a real life situation. We have such a connected world right now, battery power is everything. So uh, anything that works with battery power gets somebody who's using a laptop or a smartphone's attention. Next is the customer reason why. These are, these are a little more difficult ads to produce. Uh, smart companies use them all the time, as you'll see. But one half of all advertising and the majority of successful advertising campaign comes from this customer reason why. Basically, it offers a slice of life that affects your customer, that meets some type of aspiration they have. See, here we go back to our psychographic information. What do they privately desire? Uh, a, a typical headline or a typical format that you see for a customer reason why, if you use X, then you will get Y. Uh, typical ads right now. Um, Who would have ever thought that pasta could be romantic, okay? Barilla, Barilla, uh, they use, a, 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 Cooking is love, and it helps develop the rail. Use Barilla and have a better relationship. You know, uh, Tide. Now, you know what? This goes all women's lib and equality and everything. Thank God for it. But Tide, 
actually still uses a format that goes all the way back into the 50s for what was, what was then called housewife advertising. All right, if you use our product, your family's clothes will be clean and they'll love you for it. Or, you know, the other thing is if you use Mary Callender's uh, chicken dinners, your family will love, them, love you for providing them such a great meal. So you can see you're using a product and attaching it to a psychological need or a psychological desire. And we'll actually look at the emotional uh, impact of selling here in a few minutes. Uh, Lincoln, I don't know if you, uh, and again, I love to. Right Matthew McConaughey's yeah. commercial. I just drove that car. Oh, really? <laughs> sure. Um, and, and so what's Lincoln doing? They're taking their high-end luxury vehicle and tying it to somebody who is literally on the top of this, tying it to a celebrity that epitomizes cool and suave and elegant, you know? Uh, you look at Matthew McConaughey's first couple of movies and you would have never expected him to be in a position like he is in today. Uh, he just said he's grown in an actor. But there's something else that, that's, that's kind of important issue too while I'm thinking about it. If you can tie celebrity to your product or service, um, that's, that's huge. And it doesn't have to be a national celebrity, it can be a local celebrity. One of the other things that you can do is become a celebrity in your own right. Not known all across the Merrimack Valley, but known very well among your clients and among your prospects and the people, the other people that you, know, you, you do business with. Uh, case in point, you're standing here giving presentations to chamber members, you know, so that's, that's, that's kind of a celebrity type uh, play on my part. So if you're gonna advertise, start with what's most successful. Start with the customer reason why. Build it in, bake it into a direct response ad, and um, you, you're actually gonna see some business. And uh, now that you've got your four ads and you found one that works, and you've gone headlong and say, all right, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna make, I'm gonna start advertising, I'm gonna get on Facebook, I'm gonna get uh, in the newspapers, I'm gonna do some direct mail, I'm gonna do some local TV or regional TV advertising or some regional advertising in, a, in, in magazines like Time or Forbes or um, you know, Us or People Magazine. Uh, you got your campaign, you got it going, You've spent the money and you've deployed it. And here's what happens in most businesses, okay? Now, would any professional sports team, no matter how bad they are, ever take the field without a game plan before the start of a game? No, they wouldn't because you wouldn't have head coaches, you wouldn't have head coaches changing so often on a lot of teams, okay? A game plan is everything. Knowing who you're facing, what the challenges are, what your response is to those challenges, uh, is very critical. And knowing that everybody on your team knows who you're playing, what the challenges are, and how you're gonna, how you're gonna rise to those challenges. But a lot of times, um, this is the typical response that, that I see with small, and not necessarily just sole proprietor business. I'm talking businesses that maybe have up to 10 employees. The owner comes out and says, hey, Helen, I got three ads hitting, hitting today. I got one on the web, I got one in the newspaper, I got, a, got a, an ad in, in a local magazine. Uh, expect an expect increase in phone calls today. You know, so make sure you handle them and get them to me or get them to the sales department. Helen goes, oh, all right. Now, guess what's missing? He didn't tell her what ads are hitting, didn't tell her what offers are hitting, or whatever. All of a sudden, the phone starts ringing and Helen's getting deluged. Uh, she's, she's handling calls, she's putting people on hold, she's farming people off. Uh, maybe no one else is, uh, you know, no one else is uh, aware of what the ads are, okay? Uh, so the response by the business is never as well thought out as the, as, as the thought power that went into putting the ad and developing the ad. Next, uh, a lot of the response tends to rely on the skills of too few, uh, and that would be the owner. In, in our cases, where we're, we're sole proprietors, or it's just us, well, guess what? That's, that's just the way it goes, but there should be a system in place anyway. Uh, and the other thing is, is without proper preparation of the people that you want to handle people who respond, uh, you got them winging it and improvising it, and, and there's a case of where the ad's more thought out than the response because the, the ability to lose people because you're winging it, you don't have a good response, uh, 
the result at the end of the day is the business owner who didn't see any lift in business says, ah, advertising don't work. Poor Helen, who's been answering the phones all day, hasn't got anything else done, and she says, this advertising stuff don't work because I can't get my work done. And of course, the people who are looking, uh, who are most needed on you making a sale um, are in limbo. You know, some, you will get some sales, but you won't get as many. You left a lot of money on the table. The design the system um, is, is a little more complex, and I have to tell you, you really need to embrace the complexity, um, and there are two reasons for it. One, some systems just cannot be simplified. There are steps that have to be taken to this and this and this. If you read Peter Senge's book, The Fifth, uh, the fifth Discipline, is systems are, are what makes everything get done. Uh, the more complex the system, of course, the more steps that it requires. But the other thing is um, systems that are complex, guess what? You are all alone. If you want to make sure your competitors don't duplicate what you want to do and you want to leave them in the dust, the more complexity you have, they may try to imitate you and say, oh, it's too complex for me, or may not ever even stop because they feel it's too complex, that there might be a simpler way. So in your businesses, whenever you can, embrace the complexity uh, because it is a competitive advantage. Okay, uh, so basically, everybody that's going to be responsible for dealing with a prospect of a new ad has the ad. Uh, they also know where the ad was placed. They also know what the offer of that ad is. So you should have specialists for each ad. If you're like us, well, guess what? We, we have to be ready for whatever ads we put out, okay? Ads are coded. This is, this is really critical. You want to know where, you, where your response is coming from. Again, it goes back to that measurability and accountability and, and the ability to predict results in the future. So they're coded. So one ad says you call this particular extension. One ad says you go to this particular landing page. One ad says that you, uh, you, uh, you, know, you send, send the response device into a certain post office box or whatever. But they're coded. And that allows you to determine each ad, what it's doing for you, how much it costs, how much it produced. There are responsibilities for each ad. OK. Um, the case of too few people knowing what's going on, well, guess what? You create the specialist. They know what the ad is. Of course, then again, there are scripts. Um, it might seem like a pain. A script can take five minutes to write, or it can take five days to write, depending on the complexity of your offer and the complexity of your business. But there's no winging it. Uh, you know, the worst thing in the world is you, somebody calls, they get Stan, the salesman. Uh, all he knows is the sales call, and he, he dives right in. He dives right into a sales pitch, when the the offer might have said, "Call for some free information." <laughs> okay, so now you've got a credibility gap uh, so that can exist when you don't have a system. Okay, uh, there's complete information capture. Anything that you do, that you get a person to respond to you, you've got to be able to provide the right inf the right bribe so that you get their name their phone number, their email, their mailing address, what type of business they're in, what, why, they, why they responded to your ad. Uh, again, that, that's going a little too deep for an initial conversation, but you've got to capture information. It wastes you money to have somebody, you know, to have done so good a job to get somebody to contact you that you don't get who they are so that you can get them into your system. Uh, fulfillment and follow-up are already in place. You don't launch a campaign without everything that you're promising in that campaign all ready to go. It should be lined up. Uh, this is a, this is, is a difficult proposition if you're a growing business. You know, you've got X amount of customers, you want to get Y. Well, guess what? If you want Y number of customers, you kind of already have to have everything in place to handle that many. Otherwise, you'll get a surge in customers, and you'll get a plane crash in, in customer service, and it would have been better if you hadn't started in the first place, because you would have made a lot, you're going to upset a lot of people. Systems solve those problems. Okay? Uh, as soon as they get in, there's a funnel for the people who raise their hand and say, hey, I'm interested in your product or service. I think I'm a, I'm a legitimate prospect. There's also a funnel for info seekers. Don't spend dollars to get dimes, okay? You want to get, what you want to do, if you get people 
only maybe 1% of the people who ever respond to your ads are ready to buy right then and there. Okay, so you need a nurturing program. And then that's a separate system all to itself. And like I said, that's just the beginning. Once you get the client, once you get the prospect, once you get the name and address, now you've got other systems that nurture them along in this product or nurture them along in that service or put them right into their sales funnel. So, you, so there are several things to go. I call these money machines. Um, if you're interested, see me after. I'll, I'll get you. A, I have a special report called Money Machines, uh, and I'll get that out to you. Not that I for, didn't remember to bring it. <laughs> when to advertise? This is always a good question. Well, you know what? Anytime and all the time. If if you're in business, you know you're in business to get a client to make a sale. All right, and you have to have a steady stream of ready to go prospects so if you lose a customer somebody's already in the queue or already in your system if you're looking to expand your customer base and expand your expand your profits you've got to have a ready supply of customers coming in consistently uh, because you know what when you have clients your competitors want to pick you off people die people move uh, sometimes in your case you know you got the ultimate Self, self, self-eliminating client. They grow up. <laughs> they go, they go from preschool to regular school. Uh, you know, uh, and, and a lot of us have that too. Where you know, where the services that we offer, we maybe we can't service them anymore. They need to go like from uh, from a single copywriter or a marketing strategist to an advertising agency that that offers full service and full stop because they've grown to the point where that's what they need. So. Uh, you should always be advertising. Uh, some of the best places to add with the news cycle. Like I said earlier, Robert Collier said, if you enter the conversation already going on in a person's mind or what they're already talking about at the water cooler at work, well, guess what? You're, you're really a step ahead. Uh, you've, you've broken down a lot of barriers just, just to get their favorable attention. Okay, so the news cycle is always the best. I mean, you can go on the web any day, the Comcast or Yahoo or whatever, and you always get the top 10 trending topics. You know, if you can tie your product or service into that, uh, and especially get it up instantly like you can on a Facebook, uh, you know, it's like, I'm thinking about, well, we were talking Matthew McConaughey. Well, he's got, a, he's got a new movie that's doing pretty, that's coming out this week, I think, or last weekend. You know, if you can tie, tie his celebrity to, to something in your product, hey, that's great, you know, you're already there. Um, but one of the things uh, that's actually going out tomorrow to the, my customers who are in my funnel, uh, it's a multi, multimedia contact, well, a email's going out tomorrow, and it's, it's, the subject line is conquer the competition. And it says, dear, whatever, why should Vladimir Putin have all the fun? You know, <laughs> so you, how, you, how you can conquer your, and take over your, your competitors. Uh, and there's an offer for free information on, on how to get started. Of course, there are birthdays, there are anniversaries, there are weddings. Um, one of the things is, and I don't know if anybody here uses send out cards or whatever, uh, one of the things that I like to do with my clients is I know their, I know their anniversary dates and I know their spouse's birth dates as well. A week before, I'll send them a little note. Hey, don't forget, it's your wife's birthday next week. Or, hey, you know, your anniversary's coming up. <laughs> How many guys forget anniversaries? Um, one of the best examples I have ever seen of this, um, my wife got a postcard from the Bradford Exchange that said, hey, Tim's birthday's coming up. Here are a couple of birthday suggestions for me. Um, now, this is what I find immediate. This is a company that's very sophisticated in using its list. I have never, she is only of the Bradford Exchange, it's made up of three companies. The Bradford Exchange, the uh, Ashton Drake Galleries, they're the ones that do all those really lifelike dolls, and, um, and the Hamilton Collection. Now, I bought from the Hamilton Collection and I bought from the Bedford Galleries, um, the Bedford Exchange. My wife's only bought something from, uh, from Ashton Drake for our daughter. But somehow they got it figured out. Like, oh, look, there's the name, there's a Hayes, there's in the same address. That, she's a woman, he's a guy, that's got to be, boom. <laughs> so here they are. And how they got my birthday, I'll never know. <laughs> all right. So they're, they're, they're really mining data from all over places. Uh, if you can ever get any level of that sophistication, 
think of the, of the advantage you have over your, over your competition and in your advertising. Oh yeah. Do we look at all the pictures no. the papers anytime anybody oh, sure. the agency we would have the chart, the card, flowers, something to help like oh, yeah. depending on who the client was or Oh absolutely. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> but you know what? You'd be surprised what kind of emotional response that they get uh, from your clients. So you know you stop to think. Um, one of the things and of course you'll see it here today, um, you know, one of the things when I meet people, first thing they get in the next two days is a thank you card. And I get people like, wow, I, no one's ever sent me a thank you card. I've been to these events all the time, and no one's ever sent me a thank you. Well, guess what? You're also in my funnel, too. <laughs> That's just the tip of the iceberg or the funnel. But, but it's always a good thing. Whenever you can say thank you, do it. Um, after they buy, uh, so many business owners kind of fall down after this. They've made the sale. They said, ah, good, I made the sale. Uh, well, you know something? The reason you made the sale was to get a client. All right? They have other needs. They have, they have other aspirations. They have other wants. Uh, you should be able, you know, your, your offerings should be able to get it. So as soon as they make a sale, the first thing you want to consider is getting them to buy again. Because if you get them to buy again within the next 90 days, the odds are you own that customer for years, okay? Uh, so, and again, we go back to why is it so difficult to get a customer? Well, guess what? We're actually exploiting their, their, their change pattern. You know, it, maybe they've made a change or maybe you're their first time with your product or service. Guess what? Keep them, you know, so you want to make them an offer as soon as possible. Anytime your competition isn't advertising, you know, I see, uh, you know, the, uh, the Valpac mailers and, and the like. One of the, I see three consistent businesses in there all the time. I see Drake at Service, Drake at Auto Butler, and, and Drake at House of Pizza in them every single time. Now, one month I may see um, Bob's Pizza in there, or Brother's Pizza, and they're not there, but Drake is right there every month. So something's going right. They're exploiting. They're going to where they're, they're actually advertising where their competitors aren't. Um, Pick a reason, any reason, in any season. You can go online to calendar.com. I'm telling you folks, there's no lie. Every day is a holiday. Every day is a special day. Every month is a special month. Every week is a special week. There's the people who love cottage, people who love cottage cheese week, um, but at a dairy council. There, uh, there's actually uh, a day uh, in the calendar, the birth date of the guy who invented wiffle ball, 1950. Uh, there's also the... Um, you think of it, it's on there, okay? What month, you know, this is, this is November. This is, the, this is actually the month of the wolf moon. So, you know, if you can tie anything into these, go for it because uh, you, don't, you, you don't need a reason to advertise, but if you tie it to a reason, people will say, oh, yeah, hey, that's a pretty good idea, or at least these people are advertising. So you want to, as much as you can, try and tie it into, if you've got no reason to advertise, just go online, figure out what special month it is, and go for it that way. If you do newsletters, people I, who do newsletters are always like, oh, I'm always trying to figure out what, what can I put in my newsletter. Go right to the calendar. All right, this is the November news month. In the month of November, there's this, 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 and this. Tell me there isn't fodder for your news. There isn't reasons to write articles in your newsletter uh, that you can. It's all right there in front of you. Okay, so don't pass up. The key point is, and, and people get a little sensitive about this because opportunism can be very cruel. Uh, and the um, you know, people who are the best opportunistic people are con men. Uh, and they have no conscience, they, but they will take every opportunity to take your money. Well, add some morality to it. Business is opportunistic. Now, you know, when I'm putting out a headline that says, why should Vladimir Putin all the fun? Well, you know, I'm going to offend some people of Ukrainian background. I know that. But, you know, it's part of the advertising. It is, it's a way of tying into something very topical. So uh, the late Gary Halbert used to say, that if you're, you know, if you're trying to attract foxes, you're going to offend some dogs. So don't worry. The, the people who you don't want to business, do business with are the ones that are not going to like what you're doing anyway, especially your competitors. Where to advertise? Well, this is where 
our demographic and psychographic information actually pays off, okay? The best place to advertise, of course, is in as many places as your clients are and few, if any, or your competitors aren't, okay? How do we do this? Well, guess what? This is where demographic and, more importantly, the psychographic information comes in. Uh, I know as a copywriter, uh, one of the keys to finding the right message is knowing how the people you're targeting think. Uh, and you know what? If they think a certain way, they do certain things. Uh, they read certain magazines. They have certain political affiliations. They belong to certain groups. They have certain values that some places have and other places don't, they, where they gravitate to and where they shun. So that's where you want to go. Now, a few things on where to advertising. A good, one of the good practices is, you know, if something works, you stick with it and you actually find other places just like it to put in. Like I was saying earlier, if some of the local businesses, they use the Val back in community values. They're in there every month. Well, you know what, if you're in community values and you're not in the Val pack, you kind of missing you kind of missing the boat. You've got to, if it's the same ad that's been running all the time. You know the ad is getting you business. Well, find more places to put it. Okay, uh, that are similar. That have the similar readers. Better. Okay, it'd be creative with your advertising. If it's going to be there, make it the best ad it absolutely can be. As part of your handout today, I included a checklist of how to write a direct response ad. Um, this this is. Uh, this is um, basically 100 years of testing, working, getting sales, refining. Uh, um, and it's odd, the same list that was 100 years ago actually still works today. Uh, it may work, it, you have to use different media, of course, but uh, make sure that uh, you be creative and use direct response ads. Have some fun with your advertising. The worst thing you can be in marketing your business is boring. Okay? Maybe you have a boring business, but you know what, you should, Make it so it's interesting. <laughs> interesting. Uh, if it's a necessity, yes. Okay, so say for example, with, um, you know the story bump function in uh, Facebook. Yes. How do you use that to create more creative and fun advertisements? You know, but you really. It, it, it all depends on you and how well you know your customers. Do you know what makes them happy? Do you know what makes them, might make them laugh? Do they share the same sense of humor that you do? Uh, do they share the same concerns over various social issues that you do? Uh, can you lighten it up? That, that's, that's my biggest question. It's like um, one of the most, uh, I, did a, I was working with a company called Greenlight Realty back uh, in 2008 when the real estate market crashed. And they were, they were specializing in um, Low sales, uh, you know, I can't remember the name of it, uh, sub sales. And the first thing, the ad that we put out, are you upside down? And we had the word upside down, written upside down in the ad. Now, here's people who were losing equity left and right, who were losing their homes left and right, and yet we found a way to make a little bit of a joke out of it by putting the word upside down, upside down. Actually got us, uh, of, of the three ads that we tested, that gave us, believe it or not, it gave us the best response. Because the people who are in such a stressful situation appreciated a little humor. Uh, of course, we weren't out to snark them either. The, the ad was, was for a special report on what to do if you, what are your options if you're underwater. Uh, so uh, try and use humor where you can, uh, or at least be creative. Look at all the ad, if you ever, you know, the original, the original Google is, is the yellow pages. Open up the yellow pages and take a look. There's nothing like a sea of sameness than you see in a yellow page ad. But every now and then you'll find one company that's got a headline instead of their company name. Um, there's something different about it. Collect this kind of stuff. You know, when you get junk mail, actually look at it and see if that, hey, I could use this idea or whatever. But you want to be creative. Finally, the best, of course, is be alone. Uh, try and find those places where you are that no one else are. If I open up the Lowell Sun on Saturday, I see a ton of ads for financial planners and insurance specialists. If I open up my issue of Forbes at the end of the week, I see little to no, you know, they, they actually break down advertising so it can be regional or local. Uh, it's a little expensive, but guess what? Are there more of your clients for financial planning reading the Wall Sun, or are there more of them reading Forbes magazine? 
So that's what you want to do. And guess what? How many, how many people who read, say, Forbes magazine or read the New York, uh, the, the, the Wall Street Journal, how many people who specialize in preparing foreign and high-end foreign automobiles are there advertising? Guess what? None. You'd be pretty, pretty rare and pretty, it'd be a pretty bold play uh, to advertise there. But guess what? No one else is. So you can reduce your cost by going to a regional or a special magazine. Special thing like, like uh, financial news television, uh, MSN, yeah, uh, MSNBC, and those. Guess what? Those are cable networks. Those have regional ads. Uh, Jennifer Lane, who's a, a client that I've worked with, she's a financial planner. She actually has a TV show on NECN. Uh, and, but she uses cable advertising. And you know how many financial players, planners are actually using that channel? Very few. So she is where her competitors aren't, and, it, and it's working out for her. Uh, the other thing is, is if you've got a lot of ideas, and you've got a lot of products, and you've got a lot of services, a lot of times say, OK, well, this ad's going to just do this. And when that campaign's over, I'm going to do this. And when that campaign, I'm going to do this. There's a sequential nature to, to, to advertising. Um, Again, if you have the right systems in place, you can pull this off. You should be uh, simultaneous. You should have a lot of ads. If you've got a lot of different products, you should be advertising a lot of different products. Um, you should have that, um, not a sequential advertising, but simultaneous advertising going on. Again, you want to stuff that pipeline. You want to get that machine processing as many clients as possible in as many ways as possible. Of course, no matter what, if you sell X, you can sell them Y later. You may be able to migrate them to Y later on. Okay. Next, and, and this, uh, this is the other psychogra psychographic information. Uh, that's rare, you know, it's kind of funny. It's rarely used. Smart companies do it all the time. But um, we buy on emotion. We like to think that we're logical. We go through this. Uh, in the end, it's, it all comes to emotion. In the book that I mentioned earlier, People, Pattern, Power, um, the Wood Smalls actually have a, make a, a case that some people uh, buy on logic, a logic people pattern. And then they go and they delve into it and find out that the logic people pattern is really an emotional people pattern that's disguised as logic. So it, it's pretty, if you ever get a hold of that book, it, it's really kind of a fun read. Um, now, of course, I have to warn you, this section is only for people who sell to people. <laughs> And you think your business is different? Well, yeah, but you know what? As humans, we all have, we all, we're all based on emotions. There are basically 29 buying emotions uh, that at least I've been able to discern so far in reading and writing and, and practicing writing ads and, and campaigns and strategies. There are 10 common fears um, and strike terror into all of our hearts. There are 11 common frustrations and there are six common desires. Uh, there's probably eight, because I, mean, I guess we've all, if you've ever been to high school, you know Maslow's hierarchy of, uh, so maybe there's eight, but there, there's actually six that we can actually wrap our hands around and actually use. Uh, the 10 fears that we humans share, we fear the unknown. Um, you coming here today is kind of a way of kind of stepping into the unknown, because we just said what you were going to see. We didn't tell you exactly what you were going to see. So you've invested your time here today. Uh, but you know what? You kind of stepped in here not knowing what was going to happen to you. Uh, and if you'd be the same person when you walked out the door. Um, fear of embarrassment. Uh, nobody. Of the, of the two fears on this list, uh, psychologists tell us that the absolute worst is the fear of embarrassment and the fear of confusion. Um, if your product or service can ease any of these fears, failure, poverty, loneliness, dependence, betrayal, I mean, none of us want to be stabbed in the back, uh, illness or disability, um, you know, one of the things that you see that, that really um, fear poverty, how many commercials do you see on TV now for reverse mortgages for for people 62 or older. I mean, everybody's got a smokesman. Robert Wagner, Henry Winkler, um, Dan, I can't remember his last name. Uh, and then there, you can't turn TV on. I don't know if you ever get the opportunity to turn it on during the day. You can't get past these commercials. Uh, illness and disability. Um, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, they're advertising. Uh, all of the new health plans that are under the new health care plan, they're advertising like crazy. Um, 
AARP is probably the biggest healthcare insurance provider going because it, what happens is the shortfall. And they, they, that, think about how many fears that plays on at once. Fear of being uh, sick or ill, fear of being driven into poverty, uh, fear, a confusion of not knowing what benefits you have and what benefits you don't have. So the, these are real, and if you can tie any of these emotions and solving them, amen, not, not you're going to create for them. That's the last thing you want to do. That's, that's, that's chasing business away. But if you can show that you can alleviate these fears, you, you now on a, you got a strong position for selling. 11 frustrations that drive us nuts. Well, you know something? Uh, uh, an extreme difference dealing with an extreme sameness person drives us nuts, no doubt about it. But there are other things. The feeling of being inadequate, OK? Oh, I can't, I can't get this done. If you can boost people's confidence with your product or service, use it. Um, fear of being unimportant. Uh, related to inadequate, but, but not, not the same. Uh, being unappreciated. No, you know, the, the greatest desire of us from when the time we're children to the time we're here now is that we want to feel accepted and we want to be part of the group. Uh, you know, my biggest fear, of course, when I make a presentation like this is I'm going to piss you all off. <laughs> all right? Uh, and, and, I, and you come up to me and say, that was the worst presentation I've ever seen in my life. I don't know why I spent an hour and a half with you today. But uh, it's frustrating. Feeling of powerlessness being used or taken advantage of, oppressed, deprived, uh, demeaned or labeled, uh, or stigmatized. Um, some of the folks that you work with, um, some of them are disabled veterans or have um, a post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, you know, that's a frustration for these guys that he works with. Yes, Mike. Because I put seven in twice. You know, I was editing this thing up the last night, and I still oh, okay. missed up. I'm sorry. I, no, I, I, no. Maybe there was a oh, nine. No, 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 no. Seven, no. Seven. This should be. Change that day. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Actually, I can go in right now and do it, but <laughs> I'd bore the crap out of you. <laughs> uh, being made to feel guilty. You know, how many mothers control their children uh, to, to the nth degree? And how many mothers have created adults that can be controlled by guilt? You know, so, you know, it's a frustration. We don't want to feel guilty. Life's going too fast. Um, a, a great example of that is, um, what is it? Yeah, 11 years ago, we adopted, my wife and I. We both had kids young. Kids were growing up. All of a sudden, let me tell you, when you don't have kids, life, you wake up one morning, it's New Year's Day, you wake up the next day, and it's Christmas Eve, and you go, what's going on? We adopted partially. Well, that was the, ben it was the unintended benefit. But uh, we did it to slow time down. And of course, the other thing is, is that technology is overtaking us, and we're becoming frustrated. I will send you uh, 11 common desires. But of course, there's the desire to be successful. There's the desire to be loved. There's the desire to be accepted. Uh, the guys that you work with who feel so far on the outs, that's a frustration that you, know, you should be bringing that home to the people that you're looking for and donors. Um, of course, there's the desire to be appreciated. There's the desire to be successful. And none of us want to be losers. Uh, so in conclusion, um, I actually have a question that you can ask yourself that kind of, I'm glad I put it at the end, because it would eliminate the need for this entire presentation. But uh, whenever things, you're looking to improve your business, get more business, improve your life in general, there's one question you can ask, and you've got to look in the mirror. Uh, and, and really answer this truthfully, but it's what am I doing now that has caused the result that I'm getting? So if you've got an ad that's not working, your, your, it's your ad. It's what you put in the ad that's not working. Uh, you know, if you're not tapping into the right fears uh, or the right frustrations, um, then ask yourself, what, what's, what am I doing now that's causing the result that I'm getting? And that's a business you can ask yourself and just generally in life. Uh, you know, if my, well, if my business didn't grow as much as I did this year, OK, what did I do that works? And then come up with the other. What did I do that's not working, that I need to improve? So that's what you need. Uh, I want to thank you for coming here. Um, I guess I spoke a little longer than my power ability of my computer. <laughs> but thank you uh, for your attention. And I really appreciate coming here. If you have any questions, 
Just come on up and ask. You don't have to do a formal session. And uh, there's still coffee and muffins to help yourself, OK? Thank you.